None of us can escape death. That all, all of us, no matter how powerful or strong, whether from the east or west, or whoever we are, or how powerful our fortunes are, there's no way to escape uh, symbolically the Lord of death. So therefore, instead of contemplating and, and worrying about death, it will be more important to think and contemplate what can we do before that happens that would bring up that would bring great consequences to others and to ourselves. So therefore, uh, to contemplate on that and to think about all the things that we've done in our life that we regret, that we silly regret, including me, all of us have done things that we regret and that has repercussions. And then to think about all the things that we have done in our lives that has been very beneficial, that has beneficial effects. And to contemplate on all the negative things we have done and regret. And to contemplate on all the good things that we have done, which is probably more, and be happy and to rejoice. And to think about that and to visualize the person that we care about very much, and along with that, everybody else who suffers the same sufferings that we do when we lose a, a departed dear one, and to dedicate that this person and the family may recover, and that they can do something positive in their memory, and also, in, philosoph in philosophical debates, we can debate previous and current and next life, but I won't get into details now, to actually pray for this person, and dedicate the energy that they can take a very good rebirth. So, um, we don't have to be a Buddhist. We don't have to convert. We don't have to accept Buddhism. But what we can accept is compassion. What we can, what we can accept is love. What we can accept is good energy. And what we can accept is care. So when we recite this holy and very powerful mantra, Om Mani Peme Hong, it is hail to the jewel in the lotus. Om represents for us body. Hong represents his mind. Ah represents his speech. Om Mani Bema Hong encompasses the three powers that the Buddhas contain, which is body, speech, and mind. Therefore, when we recite hail to the jewel in the lotus, it's a double fold meaning. The outer meaning is soliciting the energies of compassion so that we can forgive and let go of things that we have done to others and let go of things that others have done to us and on an inner level on an inner level to open up the energies that we have that can develop compassion so therefore when we recite all money to make home all money to make home all money to home and we meditate on the things that we have done just meditating on compassion is not tangible but to meditate on the things that we have done or focus on the things that we have done that we regret and truly think about it and face it Sometimes it's very hard to look at things that we've done that we regret, that we don't like, but to face it, overcome it, and to resolve, I will do that. And then to focus on the things that we have done positively, and well, and good, and to increase that. What is that? That is introspection. So whether we're a Buddhist, or we're not a Buddhist, we can use Buddhist techniques in order to go to the source of our unhappiness and happiness, which is the mind. In any case, when we recite the mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum, 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 It doesn't have to be loud. It can be on the chair, it can be quietly, and you can focus on anything. You can focus on God. You can focus on Jesus. You can focus on the Buddha. You can focus on Kuan Yin. You can focus on love. Anything that you wish. But the important thing is to direct your mind towards something that's very positive. So when you recite it, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, then you visualize the person that you have lost in front of you, clean, dressed well, smiling and happy. And you recite this mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum, and you pray to them, you pray and you wish for them to move on, go on their next journey, to take a rebirth and to let go, that everybody here will be fine. If we do this whole money, then we'll whole money, then we'll money, then we'll money. Ten rounds a day for 49 days and dedicated to this person that's passed away. It will be an expression of our love. It will be an expression of our grief. Why? Of course we need to cry. Of course we need to feel sad. But that is energy. We can direct that towards 
dedicating it for that person that has passed away. So, I don't know what religious denomination you are at, but I can, off I can only humbly offer you what I learned from this holiness, which is if you recite Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, ten rounds a day, and you dedicate it to your brother, it will be extremely beneficial. Not just close mindedly say, oh, I, I dedicate, I dedicate to you, but to also do the contemplation that I have taught you. We believe that when a person passes away, they have seven consecutive in-between state deaths. So after seven day, days, they will die again. After seven days, they will die again and again for 49 days maximum. It can go up to seven to 14, but there's no set. But the set number is 49. In that state, their body is of course not there anymore, but their mind is very quick and very fast. So when we think of them immediately, they can appear in front of us, they can be near us. We can't see them, sometimes we can feel them. They'll be there, why? Because their attachment to what they were attached to during life is very strong. They haven't taken on a new rebirth. So during this period, they travel by mind only, which means only the mind travel at the speed of not light, the speed of thought. So when we visualize them, we will hook them in. When we think these thoughts and we dedicate to them, it will help them. It will definitely help them. Why? Compassion is universal. It is definitely universal. All right? So if you feel comfortable and you feel all right about that, um, since you have shared this personal tragedy with us, then I need to share with you a remedy that you can do. And if you don't do it, it's all right. If you do it, why not? It's like if we rock climb, wonderful, we get in shape. If we don't do it, all right? <laughs> Let's hope that we stay in shape on our own. So, um. This is my rosary, and I'd like to offer this to you as a gift to use in memory of your brother and to recite Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. Hail to the jewel in the lotus. The jewel in the lotus. Jewel in the lotus. Lotus represents compassion. The jewel is the mind. So it's contacting an outer source, what we call in Sanskrit, Avalokiteshvara, or great compassionate one. And we're contacting the inner source, the compassion we have in us, like into a lotus opening up. All right? So Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum. You can do it anywhere. You don't need an altar. You can sit at the desk and do it. You can sit at home and do it. The important thing is think about your brother. All right? I'm not here to convert. I'm not here to force. I'm not here to tell you that Buddhism is the religion, and it is the best religion, and it is the only religion. And if you don't follow Buddhism, then you are not going to have salvation, and you are not going to go to the kingdom of Buddha. I'm not here to tell you that if you don't practice Buddhism, you're all bad, and you're not good. I don't believe any of that. I don't believe any of that because Buddhism doesn't believe in that. You see, all of us have many similarities, many, and all of us have a few differences. The differences that we have between each other is very few, but the similarities that we have is much, much more. And sometimes in life, we tend to look at the differences more than the similarities. And when we look at the differences more than the similarities, we lose ourselves. We lose who we are. We lose our true nature. You see, to be nasty, to be arrogant, to push someone down, to hurt other beings, to do things that damage other beings is actually unnatural. People think that it is natural, but it is not natural. And I'll explain why and show why. To hurt another being, to take advantage of another being, or to be selfish, or to think of only oneself, is a very unnatural state of mind. And I'll explain why in a little while. But what's more important is all of us have many similarities. For example, we all want happiness. We all don't want suffering. We all want a long life. We all want health. We all want good food. We want a comfortable, nice place to stay. 
We all want to wear comfortable clothes. We want to be surrounded by people that love us. And we want to be surrounded by people that we love. We want people to be honest with us. We want people to be direct and straightforward with us. We want an education, and we want the best that life has to offer. We all want that. Now, there are, those are very, very big similarities. We all have feelings. We all can get hurt. We all can feel happiness. We're very similar in many ways. At the same time, being very unique sociological beings, we also have some minor differences. For example, we come from different unique cultures. We speak different languages. We have different facial features. We prefer slightly different foods, different dance, different types of music. But those are very minor differences. And, so, and we come from different religious backgrounds. Some of us come from the beautiful faith of Islam. Some of us come from the compassionate faith of Christianity. Some come from the very, very incompassionate faith of Hinduism. Some of us are Buddhists. We all live in this world with our unique culture. And some of us even know religion and free thing, which is fine, which is fine. But one thing we have in common is we all need to live together. We all need to exist together. And to exist together, either we can focus on the differences and make more differences from the differences and build on that and create more unhappiness and disharmony and enemies, or we can focus on the similarities. If we focus on the similarities, and those are much more, then we will see the differences go away. And the differences become not important at all. It's what we choose. If we have a husband, if we have a wife, on a very personal level, we can look at the differences we have and focus on that and always say there's this difference and make the differences bigger and bigger or we can look at the similarities. We can do that with our siblings, we can do that with our friends, we can do that with our spouses, we can do that with anyone. If we choose to focus on the differences, then there will be no end. If we choose to focus on the similarities, it is not in denial of the differences. It is in acceptance of the differences, but embracing something that will create more harmony. So according to Lord Buddha, that will be a better state of mind. Why? Whether we are religious or whether we are not religious, and whatever religion we are interested or not interested in, we are all interested in happiness. We are all interested in harmony. We are all interested in growth. And we are all interested in expansion, self-expansion, outer expansion, inner expansion. We're all interested in that. Since we're all interested in that, how to overcome the differences? Oh, you're a Buddhist, I'm not. You're a Christian, I'm not. I'm a free thinker, don't force your ideas on me. We all talk about inner peace and inner harmony. That's, that's beautiful, that's wonderful. But let's go one step further. How to achieve. How to achieve. So in Buddhist philosophy, you don't achieve it by running to the mountains and chanting. You don't go in, you don't go and take your rosary and recite Om Mani Padme Hum one million times and you don't see anybody. You, that's not the way to achieve it. How to achieve it is by logic, by direct perception. Topa, Kabaduki Topa in Tibet we say. Direct perception by logic and contemplation. Contemplation and meditation is very similar. People have a wrong view about meditation. They think it's sitting there doing nothing and breathing. That is not meditation. There are two types of meditation. One is analytical and one is to focus to gain awareness. Awareness meditation. Analytical meditation is very important. Why? Meditation is using your mind to think about the pros and cons of a subject, a person, an idea, a phenomenon. To think about the pros and the cons over and over again until we come to a correct understanding. When our mind meditates or focuses on the phenomenon and we can, delicate, we can segregate what is positive and negative, in time, our mind will drift away from the negative and be attracted to the positive. And from that type of meditation, what will happen is this, you will find your habits start to change. You will find your speech start to change. 
you will find that your motivation starts to change. When that starts to change, you receive the purpose of religion. You see, unbeknown to many people, we don't go to the temple and we don't go to the church. And we don't go to the synagogue and the mosque to always ask a higher being, give me money, give me a relationship, give me more money and change my relationship. I don't like the one I have. And make my business grow. And we act and I get slim along with that too. And that's what we usually pray for. Just think if your mother Mary at the church, if you're Kuan Yin at the temple, if you're Buddha at the temple, or you're God listening down at the mosque, and all these people coming every single day saying, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. That's all they hear. But it's very rare. Once in a while you hear a voice such as Mother Teresa's, or Mahatma Gandhi's, or the Dalai Lama's, saying, no, I ask you to give them. Isn't that refreshing? If you were God, if you were Buddha, to look down and say, oh my God, out of 5.2 billion people, one is asking me to help somebody else. Isn't that refreshing? Maybe that's why these people like the Dalai Lama and Mother Teresa came out superior and better and worship and, and, and respect it because they have a quality in their mind that is going back to their natural source. If we're always going to the holy places and saying, me, 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 what makes us stand out even from the animals? What makes us stand out? If we expect respect, if we expect love and compassion, we have to exude and have that. If we're always thinking about me, or us, or I, it is unnatural. Why is that unnatural? Thinking about me and not others is unnatural because to be not nice, to another person, to take from another person, to suppress another person's culture, to suppress another person's religion or thoughts or feelings. I mean, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about Jack the Ripper, I'm talking about real positive feelings. It's very unnatural. Why is it unnatural? I'll tell you why. Use your logic. Use your logic. In life, for most of, most of us, most of us, our mother, has been the kindness to us. Some of us have weird mothers, yes. You see, in Tibetan Buddhism, it's a matriarchy of society in Tibet. Women hold the power in our country. Women can get married as many times as they want, and it is very common for a woman to have two, three, four husbands living in the same house with her. And it is uncommon, and it's not possible for a man to have three or four wives, that's one. A woman may divorce the man anytime she likes, and take half the property. And in Tibetan Buddhism, women have the exact same opportunity to teach. Some of the highest ranking lamas in our society is female. So along, that comes from a Buddhist culture of worshipping kindness. How do we worship kindness? Father and mother are very kind, but there's an exceptional focus on the mother because the mother carries the child in her womb, gives up her freedom, stretches her body and endures a lot of physical pain for the child. And even after many months of enduring pain, and many times over, even after the child has come out, so much, if it was a normal life, someone that gives you that much pain, you would view them as an enemy. But when the child comes out, the mother still views the child as a very close and loving being. So when we grow up and we think about our mothers, and how much our mothers have done for us, our hearts soften, our minds open, and deep respect comes for our mother. And sometimes, even when people say to you, hey, would you do that if your mother's here? Would you do that if your mother's watching you? You say, oh no, I wouldn't. Why? There's a deep respect for the mother. So when we have that deep respect and affection for the mother, where did that come from? Is that the mother was very kind to us. So therefore, when we are nice, and respectful, and we take care of our mother back, we feel happy. Society feels happy. People respect us. We also feel we have done something good. Why is that? Because that is going back to our natural state of mind. 
When we take care of our mother, when we give her a gift, we send her flowers, or we wish her happy birthday, or we say, "Mommy, thank you for taking care of me." We feel happy, and she feels happy. Why? You're tapping into something that is a natural state of mind, which is remembering kindness or compassion. So therefore, you can check with your logical mind. It is not just the Buddhist running around saying, "Oh, compassion, compassion, compassion." It is something that you cannot develop. People say, "Compassion is not for me." Love is not for me. I'm not there yet. I can't be there yet. But what they don't understand is, it's not there or here. It's inside of you, and it's a natural part of you. And how to prove that by debate and logic is, for example, like your mother who has been very kind to you. How do you feel? We feel to repay her kindness. We feel to give back her kindness, and we will endure many difficulties for our mother. I mean, in a normal sense, and that can be for a brother, that can be for a sister, that can be for a father, that can be your aunt, that can be your uncle, a grandmother, etc., etc. I'm using the mother as a prototype. So, therefore, when we can repay the kindness of our husbands and wives and friends and uncles and friends, friends have helped us along the road of life, and we think about them in very nice terms and we feel good about them. That feeling of good, that feeling of appreciation. And that feeling of sharing with them, and that feeling of remembering them, when we feel that our blood pressure goes down, our our body relaxes, we don't create diseases such as cancer. Our whole being exuberates calmness and happiness, and people will come around us feel relaxed. When we don't appreciate someone that's been kind to us, and we cheat them, we lie to them, we retaliate to them, we harm them, and we do negative things to them. When we do that, we don't feel good. We are always on the defense, and we're always on the guard. Who will know? Who? How will I be discovered? How long will this last? Okay, I'll do this for a while till I'm all right, and I'll take care of them later. We don't feel comfortable. We don't feel. At ease, and people who come around us, they always feel like something's wrong with us. We're hiding something. We're avoiding something. That, to you, without God or Buddha or or deep philosophy, is pure, straight, simple logic. What Buddha says: Check your mind. When you do something negative to people, how do you feel? You feel unnatural. You don't feel comfortable. You don't feel nice. Example: When Mr. Jerome here says he's going to help those people in Mustang, and obviously you can see he gets nothing back. It's pure altruistic giving. How does it feel? Even this year, with respect to all of you, you can't afford to help from this business, but you're already planning to help from next next year's business. Even if it materializes or not, doesn't matter. You're inspired by him. Why are you inspired? You're inspired by him because. It is tapping into your natural state of mind. What is your natural state of mind? A kind person, a compassionate person, a person that wishes to bring happiness to others. We are inspired not because we don't have the qualities. It is somebody opening the qualities for us, and therefore the word inspiration to inspire. That is the meaning to me. What it says in Webster's, I have no idea. But why is that? Why are we inspired? Why do we feel good? We're going to our natural state of mind. We're going to who we really are. Who are we? What Buddhism is sharing with you is not convert, 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 convert. Not oh, if you're not a Buddhist, you're bad. No. What Buddhism seeks to achieve is twofold. Harmony in society. Harmony within the family. Harmony between cultures. Harmony with yourself. That's the first one that Buddhism wishes to achieve. The second one that Buddhism wishes to achieve is higher attainments, higher level of mind, a type of mind that can be surpassed, that can grow to the level of someone like Mother Teresa. Someone like the Dalai Lama, and that is possible. They're human beings too. They're human beings. So therefore, first goal is to achieve harmony with ourselves, to achieve harmony with others, to achieve harmony with people that are close with us, and to achieve harmony from that into society, back into the world.
one step at a time. This is what Buddhism seeks to achieve. Not to convert, not to have everybody be dumped in a, in, in a saffron water, come out, and you say, oh, now you're blessed by Buddha and you're baptized. No. Not to criticize other religions, not to criticize other cultures, and other, other thoughts, and even other non-religions such as free thinking. That's not what Buddhism is after at all. At all. That is why in the history of Buddhism, since its beginning till now, there's never been one war or fighting in the name of Buddha or Buddhism ever. Ever in history. You will never hear from Buddhism come fighting, terrorism, war, killing, destruction. Never. Because it is totally against all Buddhist principles. But what Buddhism wishes to achieve is this. Understanding of each individual's religion. Each individual's religion. To cohabitate together religiously, culturally, harmoniously. How do we achieve that? I go back to what I first explained to you first, which is to think not of our differences, but to focus on our similarities. I'm a human, you're a human. I need love, you need love. I need care, you, I need compassion, so do you. I need a religious tenant to guide me to become a better person, so do you. What religion you choose, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What religion you choose doesn't matter. Even if you don't choose a religion, it doesn't matter. What matters is the time we have here on this earth to not waste it by following wrong concepts such as selfishness, who is better, who is superior, which is better, which is wrong, which is not wrong. To be compassionate is natural. To be not compassionate is not natural. And let me use an example for you again. Remembering one's mother's kindness, and we feel good, and our mother feels good, and the family around us feels good. Why does everybody feel good? Why? Because it's natural. Not respecting and loving our mother. We don't feel good, she doesn't feel good, and the people around us don't feel good. Why is that? Because it is unnatural. Very logical. Whatever religion you are, whatever religion you're not, you can use your mental capacity and educated mind to think about that. It's unnatural. Totally unnatural. Anything that is unnatural creates disharmony. Anything that's unnatural creates unhappiness. And when we feed into this unnatural state of mind, it will become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's the danger. So, in a plural, diverse culture, such as Malaysia, a plural and diverse culture such as Malaysia, where all the people in all cultures and all religions can live together so beautifully, so wonderfully, so harmoniously, what does that come from? Harmony. Where does that harmony come from? It's just a word from understanding each other. How do we understand each other? By living in close proximity to each other. All the races and people here, and this is an example for every country in the world, we want the same thing. We want economic growth. We want love. We want respect. We want happiness. We want compassion. So everybody wants the same thing. They strive unto the same thing. And therefore you have this kind of very, very wonderful culture here that can get along very well. And therefore you have the different religions in this culture. Certainly when we go to a restaurant and there's a buffet, not everybody will be attracted to the same item on the buffet. Definitely not. But if this person chooses this item on the buffet and you don't, why would you argue that's better and that's not good because you didn't like it? In a buffet, the purpose is to fill your stomach, get energy and move on. So if you're going to argue what's better in the buffet, that is very unnatural. Why is that unnatural? Why is your preference better than another? Similarly, in Buddhist view, to have many religions and a variety of religions is even better. Why? Everybody has different mentality. Everybody has different disposition and different, and different needs. Each religion suits a different type of need, suits a different type of mind, and suits a different type of disposition. And when one person adopts one religion and practices sincerely, and follow the tenets sincerely. Although the paths may be 
in the beginning different. You can liken it to a mountain. You have one big mountain, you want to reach the top. You can either go this way, this way, this way, or this way. It doesn't matter which way you go to the top, as long as you get to the top. Like that, once we choose the religion, it is not that our religion is better, or their religion is better, or this is better, or this is worse, not worse. It's not about that. It's about following what you choose all the way. Buddhists are not supposed to... Uh, Buddhists are... Uh, 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 mm-hmm. Buddhists are supposed to be vegetarian. If you're not vegetarian, then you're not a good Buddhist, for example. Well, being a Buddhist is much more than just being vegetarian. And there are very, very shallow Buddhists who believe that, oh, if I go to the temple on the first of the 15th, if I offer incense to the temple, or if I am vegetarian, then I'm a good Buddhist. But I can cheat, I can trick people in business, I don't have to respect my mother, I can have 10 wives, I can throw one wife after another, I can treat people like garbage, but I'm a good Buddhist because I don't eat meat and I go to the temple the first and the 15th. Some people even think with, with respect that if they become baptized, and they accept Jesus Christ, which is beautiful, that that's all they have to do, nothing else. I just accept Jesus, and I don't have to do anything. I can do anything I want, because I've accepted Him, and therefore, I can do what I want, and then I'm okay. I find that a little unfair, because if, I, if you accept Jesus, and you can do whatever you want, and my whole life has been wonderful and good and I've been doing wonderful things and I've been a saint, like, like Mahatma Gandhi. And then when we both die, we go up there and then the person at the gate says, well, you accepted Jesus, but you've been killing and screaming and lying and cheating people. You can come in, you can't because you didn't accept. That's illogical. To me, that's not logical. I believe that once you accept Christ, your journey has just begun in self-transformation. Just self-transformation. It is simply I accept. And then make everybody else accept. If you accept, then if I reach this number, I achieve heaven. I don't think so. It sounds like a business deal to me. Similarly for Buddhists, simply saying I accept Buddha, I take refuge in the three jewels, I don't have to be compassionate because the Buddha is compassionate. So that means I can do what I want and the Buddha will be compassionate to me. Yes, the Buddha will be compassionate to you, but it doesn't mean you can do what you want. Once we accept the religious tenets or religious faith, the journey has just begun. What's the journey? It's thousands and thousands and thousands of year old methods and technique that is set out by the previous great masters, male and female, to help and guide us. Then we think, I don't need a teacher. I don't need anyone to guide us. That's ridiculous. Our whole life and everything that we know was guided by teachers. From the time of our birth from our mothers to our school teachers to our college teachers to now, even what we're doing now, even if we need to do that, we need someone to teach us. We don't simply go there and start climbing and say, I don't need a teacher, I can do everything myself. Everything comes with a teacher. So my point is, from Buddhist point of view, all religions must be respected and accepted. And not to run around telling people that Buddhism is the best and it's the only way. Never. Why is that? It's unnatural. Unnatural. We believe, why can't enlightened beings or holy beings manifest in different ways in different places all around the world at different times? To suit different cultures and different people. Why not? Second thing is, being compassionate is natural. Being not compassionate is unnatural. And I gave you an example. So today, I don't want to get too deep into philosophy or the study of monsters. I give regular teachings, I give regular talks. I also have talks on the website that you can download if you're interested. So my point is today I want to give you a little bit of a Buddhist perspective. A Buddhist perspective of how a Buddhist views the world, other religions, other cultures, other people. And to simply say, I respect is not enough, but I gave you a basis on which to respect. The basis on which to respect is 
to meditate, concentrate, and focus on our similarities, not our differences. So I am not leaving you with beautiful words and big words, world peace, inner peace, self peace. I'm leaving you with a very direct and easy method that will suit all religions, all thinkers, all cultures, and all people. What is that? To focus on the similarities that we share and not focus on the differences. That's one. The second thing is when we start our spiritual journey to focus on what? To focus on Compassion is natural. The opposite of compassion is not natural. And I gave you an example into that. So when I finish my talk now, I want to leave you with a different perspective, a different type of thinking. We can all chant, we can all pray, we can all solicit the mighty, we can all open our hands and open our hearts to the mighty. But simply opening up at that moment of our prayer, we feel very holy and good. But once we leave the holy place, we're back to ourselves. So we need something more powerful, which is penetrative insight, penetrative thought. Penetrative insight and penetrative thought is based on logic and human experience. People say, oh, Buddhism is a philosophy. It is. Buddhism say, people say that it's a religion. It is. It's a philosophy and a religion. Why? There's no separation. In order to be to have a religion, you need to have a philosophy. You need to have. You need to have a basis. 